The year is 1946. The Second World War has only recently ended, and Americans still find themselves in celebration that the long and bloody conflict is finally over. Nowhere is this feeling of elation more profound than in small town America. Who had their already tiny populations gashed due to the draft sending all able-bodied men off to the military? Two such towns were the quaint little farming communities of Texarkana, Texas and Texarkana, Arkansas, which join one another right where the state borders meet and are often referred to jointly as just Texarkana. By February of the new year, these twin cities were looking for a return to normalcy, but unbeknownst to anyone living there at the time, they would soon find themselves embedded in a horrific series of murders that would shatter the feeling of post-war optimism and bring what would become one of the most infamous cases in American history right to their doorstep. Twenty-five-year-old Jimmy Hollis and his 19-year-old girlfriend, Mary Jean LeRae, exited a local movie theater and got into Mr. Hollis's Chevy to drive home. They soon discovered that they weren't quite ready to call it a night and decided to go and park the car on a local lover's lane, which was just off Richmond Road on the Texas side of town. This was long before the era of Netflix and chill. So young couples looking to be intimate would often go and park on secluded back roads called lovers lanes that were usually very private. After parking the vehicle, Jimmy and Mary quickly settled in to get comfortable with one another for the next hour or so. Suddenly, just 10 minutes after they'd arrived, a man appeared on the driver's side of the car shining a flashlight into the window and ordering the young couple to step out of the car. He wore a white sheet over his head that the two later theorized to be a pillowcase with holes cut out for the eyes and mouth. Initially, Jimmy believed this was some sort of mistargeted prank and remarked that the stranger quote had the wrong guy. However, in response to this, the hooded man aimed a pistol up to the window and replied, I don't want to kill you fellow, so do as I say. Realizing now that this situation was much more dangerous than they first believed, Mr. Hollis and Miss LeRae did as the stranger asked and stepped out of the vehicle. When they were outside of the car, the man ordered Jimmy to remove his pants, which he did, only for the assailant to abruptly strike him across the head with the butt of his gun, the force of which was so great that Mary believed Jimmy had been shot. Seeing this as a robbery that was quickly turning violent, Miss LeRae grabbed her boyfriend's wallet out of his discarded pants and emptied it out to show the man he wasn't carrying any money. The attacker, unfazed by her pleas, proceeded to strike her alongside her head as well, knocking her to the ground. He then ordered her to stand back up and told her to start running up the road. Terrified and dazed from the blow to her head, she began running as fast as she could and frantically searched for help, which she was unable to find. The attacker soon caught up with her and asked her why she had ran. When she responded that he told her to, he called her a liar and again struck her with the weapon, knocking her back to the ground. He then got on top of her and proceeded to sexually assault her. Minutes later though, he was surprised by a set of headlights in the distance from an approaching car and quickly ran away, leaving the traumatized Mary lying on the ground. Miss LeRae stood back up and ran a half mile before she was able to finally find help from a nearby home, where she called the local police. Meanwhile, back at the scene, Jimmy had regained consciousness and stumbled up to the main road where he was able to flag down a passing car. The motorist left Mr. Hollis on the side of the road, but drove to a funeral home a few miles down the street where he used a payphone to call police. Officers arrived on scene to find a still dazed and badly injured Jimmy stumbling alongside the road. Mary was picked up by officers as well and the two were taken to a local hospital for treatment. 
where it was revealed that Mr. Hollis had suffered a fractured skull from the blow to his head. Despite the traumatic experience they had just endured, both claimed to have a clear memory of the events that had transpired. However, when they gave their statements to police, there were some key conflicting details between their accounts. Both stated their attacker was around six feet tall and carried a flashlight along with his pistol. They also gave similar accounts of how the attack itself had unfolded. But some key differences remained. Mary claimed the gunman was an African American and in his early 20s, whereas Jimmy stated their attacker was a Caucasian man in his early 30s. Due to these contradictions and the fact that a young couple being so brutally attacked at random in a small town like Texarkana seemed completely unbelievable, police theorized that the two knew their assailant and were simply trying to conceal the perp's identity. This belief, plus the lack of any physical evidence at the crime scene, made the investigation into the attack pretty much dead in the water before it even began. Soon though, officers would come face to face with the grim reality that Jimmy and Mary were in fact victims chosen at random, and that despite the undeniable horror they had endured, they had likely been spared from a far worse fate. Just over a month later, a motorist passed by a well-known lover's lane named Rich Road just south of Highway 67 on a cool Sunday morning. Here he spotted a 1941 Oldsmobile parked alongside the road. Inside was a young man slumped over on the steering wheel. Believing he was asleep, the driver got out of his car and walked over to try and wake him. But as he approached, he noticed blood coming out of his head as well as a woman lying in the back seat. He called police who arrived on scene and soon identified the bodies as belonging to 29-year-old Richard Griffin and his 17-year-old girlfriend, Polly Ann Moore. Mr. Griffin was slumped across the steering wheel with his hand still resting on top of it and had been shot three times in the head. Miss Moore was lying in the back seat face down with a single gunshot to the back of her head. An investigation of the area surrounding the car revealed blood splatter and stains in some of the patches of grass nearby as well as on the outside of the vehicle. This led police to theorize that both victims had been killed outside of the car and then placed back inside of it before the killer fled. Apart from this though, evidence at the scene was scant at best. A storm had come through the area earlier that morning, which erased any potential physical evidence such as fingerprints. A 32 caliber shell casing was recovered just outside the car, and that was all that was found. Despite a popular nightclub being just around the corner from where the Oldsmobile was discovered, no one had seen anything or heard any gunshots. Police were also unable to determine if, like Mary, Polly had been sexually assaulted as her body had been washed and embalmed by the local coroner before it could be looked at by a medical examiner. The couple had only been together for six weeks, and despite the substantial age difference, none of their friends or family were believed to have any issue with them being together. They were last seen by Molly's sister, who had dinner with them at a local cafe the night before their bodies were discovered. Now concerned there was a gunman running around targeting couples at random, police in Texas and Arkansas both launched a citywide investigation with the help of the FBI. Additionally, the fabled Texas Rangers were called in for assistance, with one particularly charismatic and famous ranger by the name of Manuel Lone Wolf Gonzalez becoming the de facto leader of the team. Manuel was an interesting man, known for his dashing good looks and his reputation as a maverick who would often brawl with suspects before placing them under arrest. He also had an attraction to speaking with the media, and loved making any kind of statement that would get him on the front page of a newspaper. During the early days of the investigation, shortly after arriving in town, he confidently declared to the reporters of Texarkana's newspapers that he wouldn't leave until the suspect was arrested or killed. 
a bold claim to be sure, but one given with such gusto that many couldn't help but believe it. Unfortunately for Ranger Gonzalez and the people of Texarkana, it was not a promise he would easily be able to keep. In both cases, there was a troubling lack of physical evidence, and the only witnesses to the killer, Mr. Hollis and Miss Loray, could not agree on the details of the suspect and were considered unreliable. Police turned to the public for help, and offered a $500 reward for any information leading to the killer's arrest. But this had the opposite of its intended effect, with many calling in false leads in hope of claiming the reward, which caused police to chase their tails. Investigators desperately hoped they would be able to find this madman before he struck again. Tragically though, that would not be the case. At 6.30 in the morning, a Mr. and Mrs. G. H. Weaver were driving down North Park Road with their young son when they made a ghastly discovery. A young man was lying dead on the side of the road. He had been shot four times. The family sped off and went to a neighbor's house to call 911. When police arrived at the scene, they immediately feared this was the work of their phantom killer. The body was identified as belonging to 17-year-old Paul Martin, who was a former resident of Texarkana that was in town visiting his parents for the weekend. He had last been seen the night before when he picked up his friend, 15-year-old Betty Jo Booker, from a dance where she had been playing the saxophone in a local band. Miss Booker was not at her home, and a search party consisting of law enforcement and local citizens quickly mobilized to try and find her. Sadly, everyone's worst fears were confirmed when at 11.30 a.m. her body was discovered behind a tree almost two miles away from where Paul had been found. She had been shot once in the chest and once in her head. Mr. Martin's vehicle, a 1946 Ford Coupe, was discovered almost three miles away from where Betty Jo's body had been found, with the key still in the ignition. The similarities to the previous attacks were certainly striking. Both victims had been shot by a 32 caliber pistol. Both had been parked in a well-known lover's lane just prior to the attack, and it was believed that Betty Jo had been sexually assaulted. However, there were some key differences. First, they had been taken quite a distance away from the vehicle before they were killed, unlike previous attacks which took place just outside of the car. Police theorized the killer had led them some distance into the woods, where Paul attempted to fight off the assailant and give Betty Jo a chance to escape. There were signs that Mr. Martin had valiantly fought against his attacker, and this would also explain why his pants were not removed like the previous male victims, as well as why both of them were found so far away from one another. Mysteriously, Betty Jo's saxophone was not found in the vehicle or anywhere near her body during the initial search of the crime scene, and it was theorized that the killer had taken the instrument to try and sell. Unlike the previous attacks though, evidence was also found in the form of latent prints on Martin's vehicle, but without a suspect to compare them to, they were all but useless. Like the other victims, neither Paul nor Betty Jo had any known enemies. Both had grown up in Texarkana and were lifelong friends who remained close even when Paul moved away to northern Texas. These murders were an absolute shock to all who knew them, and they were mourned dearly throughout the community, with the band Betty Jo Booker had played in disbanding and never playing a show again in her honor. And by this point, citizens of Texarkana were in a complete panic. A deranged killer was targeting random people who were just sitting in their cars not bothering anyone. On April 16th, the Texarkana Daily News ran a headline that read, quote, Phantom Killer eludes officers as investigation of slangs pressed. This led to the murderer being dubbed the Texarkana Phantom, and much like a phantom, he seemed to be able to appear and vanish at will. Bowie County Sheriff William Presley would later state in an interview, quote, This killer is the luckiest person I have ever known. 
No one sees him, hears him in time, or can identify him in any way. Posses were formed by the local communities who would go out and patrol the streets at night and kept a particularly close eye on the roads that were known lovers' lanes. Police even attempted sting operations, planting young-looking officers and sometimes even their own teenage children in vehicles on quiet streets, which they closely watched, hoping to bait the killer out of hiding, though these attempts ultimately proved unsuccessful. Stores quickly sold out of guns and ammunition, and the reward money was tripled to over $1,500 which again led to several false leads being called in to local police. Weeks later, the killer remained at large, with the town seemingly held hostage by the crazed murderer who would just appear from the darkness. Many teenagers and young adults decided to keep their hormones at bay and began staying inside the house during the late hours of the night, where it was safe from the killer stalking their town. Or so they thought. Around 8 p.m. on a warm Friday evening, 37-year-old farmer Virgil Starks settled in with his wife, 36-year-old Katie Starks, and began winding down after a long day of working. His back was sore from the day's work, and Mrs. Starks brought him a heating pad to help ease the pain. As she went to their bedroom to change into her nightgown, Virgil sat down next to the radio and tuned into his favorite show, beginning what both thought would be a quiet evening at home. Minutes later, as she was laying in bed, Katie heard something from the backyard and asked her husband to turn the radio down. She then heard what sounded like breaking glass from the living room and got up to see what was going on. As she exited the bedroom and went into the living room, she saw Virgil standing in front of his chair, then suddenly slumped back down into it as blood began pouring out the back of his head. Running over to her husband, Katie discovered he'd been fatally shot and quickly moved over to their phone to call police. Scared and confused as to what was going on, she was unable to see the shadowy figure standing outside her window who took aim at her as she phoned police and fired two shots. One bullet struck her in the cheek and exited behind her left ear. The other struck her jaw, shattering it with the bullet becoming lodged underneath her tongue. But miraculously, neither shot proved to be fatal. Falling to the ground, Katie immediately took notice of the man standing outside. The attacker moved from the window to the front door and began punching through the screen to try and enter. Standing back up, Mrs. Stark scrambled to retrieve a pistol from a nearby drawer, but the blood from her wounds was blinding her and she realized she wouldn't be able to fire the weapon accurately. Having failed to open the front door, the killer made his way around the side of the home and began climbing through a side rear window that led into the Starks' kitchen. Mostly blinded and terrified she was going to die, Katie decided to make a break for it while the killer was climbing into her home and ran out the front door as fast as she could. Barefoot and covered in blood, she ran over a hundred yards to the home of A.V. Prater. Her stunned neighbor answered the door and Katie exclaimed Virgil's dead before falling over from exhaustion. Prater grabbed a nearby shotgun and fired a shot into the air, which alerted another neighbor by the name of Elmer Taylor, who quickly came over to see what was going on. Mr. Prater told Taylor to grab his car, and they laid Mrs. Starks down in the back seat before Taylor started driving her to a nearby hospital. Miraculously, Katie remained conscious the entire ride to the hospital despite massive blood loss. And in case her sheer badassery wasn't obvious enough by this point, on the way there, she reached into her mouth and pulled a gold tooth out of her broken jaw and offered it to Taylor as a reward for driving her. Police were alerted after her arrival and converged on the farmhouse. They went inside to discover the heating pad Katie had given Virgil had set the chair on fire that his body had slumped into but were thankfully able to put it out before it spread to the rest of the house, 
or burned any potential evidence on Mr. Starks. The scene was described by investigators as a river of blood, with Betty Jo's blood and broken teeth lying on the floor from the living room all the way out the front door. But with no sign of the killer in the home, the phantom had once again evaded their grasp. Blockades were set up around Highway 67 in hopes of catching the perpetrator as he was trying to flee. And while some men were stopped for questioning, this ultimately didn't yield any results. Shoe prints were found leading through Katie's blood, and police discovered two flashlights at the crime scene that did not belong to the Starks. No fingerprints were found on either one, but it was determined that less than 100 of this brand and color of flashlight had been sold in the city of Texarkana, meaning there was at least a chance they could narrow down the buyer. Unfortunately, none of the stores that had sold the flashlights were able to pinpoint the identity of the person who bought them, leaving police back at square one. In a final desperate attempt, the Texarkana Gazette ran what would be the paper's first color photograph on the front page, showing the flashlight and asking readers if they knew anyone who had bought one like it. Several leads were called in, but one by one these were also eliminated, and this promising piece of evidence turned out to go nowhere. It is worth noting though, not all evidence pointed to this even being the work of the Texarkana Phantom. Most obviously, the choice of victims. Virgil and Katie were not some love-struck teenagers parking alongside an abandoned dirt road, but a married couple who were attacked in their own home. This was also the first murder that had taken place on the Texas side of the border. Shell casings recovered at the crime scene did not match the caliber of bullet that had been used at the previous shootings either. This led to many officers speculating that this was not the work of the Phantom at all, but a copycat who had a grudge against the Starks and was using the recent killing spree as a cover for their attack. This was disputed by Mrs. Starks and their friends, who insisted they had no quarrel with anyone, much less someone angry enough to try murdering them in their own home. Meaning that, like the prior victims, they had likely been chosen at random. The murder of Virgil Stark sent the already panicked town over the edge. It was bad enough that this killer could strike from the darkness of night and attack unsuspecting people parked in their own cars. But if he had become so brazen as to attack a married couple in their very own home, then truly nowhere in Texarkana was safe. Local shops that had already made sure to keep a hefty supply of guns and ammunition saw their stock get completely cleaned out. People began to set up homemade booby traps and alarms for their door in case someone tried to enter during the night. And during evening hours, Texarkana became as close to a ghost town as it could get. Unbeknownst to all of these people at the time, however, the murder of Virgil Starks would prove to be the Phantom Killer's final crime, as he would soon fade back into the darkness as quickly and suddenly as he had emerged from it. This left police with the unenviable task of trying to identify this enigmatic killer with scant evidence and few witnesses. And try as they did, the unfortunate truth is this investigation was likely doomed from the start. In the aftermath of the Phantom's crimes, police were faced with an incredible dilemma when beginning the investigations. Like we observed previously, almost no evidence outside of shell casings and some latent fingerprints was recovered from any of the crime scenes. Additionally, the panicked state of the town led to several false leads being called in that proved more distractions than anything else. It was common for police to be called to a home where a prowler was supposedly spotted, only for it to be a stray cat rummaging through a trash can outside or some other unremarkable explanation. The fear of local residents also made things harder in more ways than just this. Everyone in Texarkana, man, woman, and in some cases child, was now walking around armed and afraid. 
One officer later described the eerily tense state of the town, remarking that any time he drove to someone's home to ask them questions, he had to show up blaring his siren as to not be mistakenly shot by a frightened resident. One incident even took place where a bartender shot a patron in the foot who showed up unannounced to the tavern looking for a drink. This would have been difficult enough for a police force working together in perfect harmony, but the ragtag group of investigators searching for the phantom killer was basically as disjointed a group as could be. Many of them resented Texas Ranger Manuel Gonzalez as they felt he was more concerned with the attention he was receiving from the local and national press as opposed to solving the crime itself. And there was ample evidence to support this belief. Ranger Gonzalez would often take credit for work other investigators had done and present their findings to local news outlets as though they were discoveries he had made. In truth, despite inserting himself as the public face of the investigative team, he contributed very little to the investigation itself, preferring to remain at the station and give press briefings or to go out and give interviews on the radio where he would often leak details of the case publicly that many other officers wanted to remain private. This further muddied the waters of an investigation that was already working with very little, wasting valuable time for those who were actually out in the field doing the work Gonzalez was taking credit for. The de facto leader of the investigation being a man that very few of his colleagues actually respected resulted in a fractured approach to the investigation and a lack of coordination between the various camps of officers which no doubt lowered the odds of success further than they already were. Despite his bold claim that he would remain in Texarkana until the murderer had been caught, three months after the killing of Virgil Starks, Ranger Gonzalez would leave the town never to return. He retired from the Texas Rangers a short time later, where he then pursued a career ironically enough in Hollywood. This isn't to say the investigation was entirely fruitless, however. In fact, several suspects and persons of interest were identified. One of them, a man by the name of H.B. Tennyson, who had the unfortunate nickname of Duty, was a student at the University of Arkansas who took his own life by ingesting a cyanide pill on November 6, 1946. In his suicide note, Tennyson confessed to the murder spree in Texarkana, and physically was a reasonable match for the suspect given the information investigators had. However, further examination into his whereabouts during the murders revealed that he could not have been the killer and was likely giving a false deathbed confession, as we've seen happen in other cases covered on this channel. Another lead was a man in Corpus Christi, Texas, who walked into a music store and attempted to sell the clerk a used alto saxophone. When the store clerk told the man she would need to speak with her manager before agreeing to any such purchase, it caused him to become very nervous and flee the store just when the manager was summoned. This made the store owner contact police, and two days later the man was arrested at a hotel after purchasing a 45 caliber pistol from a local pawn shop. In his possession, Officers found a bag of bloody clothing, which he claimed was from cutting his head during a bar fight. The clerk at the music store also identified him as the man who had attempted to sell the saxophone to her, but no instrument was found in his possession or in his hotel room. Police interrogated the man over the course of the next several days, during which he adamantly denied involvement in the murders and gave alibis for the night of each attack. These alibis were checked out, and it was determined he was in fact telling the truth, eliminating him as a suspect. Oddly enough, months later in October 1946, Betty Jo's saxophone was recovered not far from where her body had been discovered, in an area that law enforcement confirmed they had searched the day her body was found, meaning that it was very likely the killer had returned to the crime scene to dispose of it. Many other suspects looked into by law enforcement resulted in similar patterns, 
police believed they may have a solid lead, but then would ultimately rule out the person. With one lone exception, who is considered by many to be the true phantom killer, Yule Swinney. Swinney was a petty criminal with a history of counterfeiting and car theft. Max Tackett, a rookie with the Arkansas State Police, noticed that on the night of Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin's murders, a car had been reported stolen, and that stolen vehicles had been found abandoned shortly after the previous two phantom attacks. Just over a month after the murder of Virgil Starks, he noticed a stolen vehicle parked in the lot of a local shopping center, and decided to stake it out and wait for the suspect to return. To his surprise, he didn't find a six-foot-tall armed man, but a thin woman who stood barely over five foot three. 21-year-old Peggy Swinney. Upon her arrest, she was taken in for questioning where she made a startling revelation. Her husband, Yule, whom she'd only recently married, was in fact the phantom killer. She took it one step further and even claimed to have been present on the night of Virgil Stark's murder and claimed to have waited in a car nearby while her husband went to the couple's home and committed his crime. Police were understandably skeptical at first, but credibility was initially lended to her story when she revealed information that wasn't known to many members of the public at the time, such as the location of some of Paul Martin's belongings which had been discarded at the scene. Officers even discovered that in the woods near Betty Jo's body, a heel print from a woman's shoe was found, with police originally thinking it belonged to Betty Jo, but now realized it could also have come from Peggy. Understandably, officers wanted to speak with her husband, but she revealed he was currently in the city of Atlanta, Texas, trying to sell a stolen vehicle. Officer Tackett contacted the police chief in Atlanta, where he discovered that a man had recently attempted to sell a stolen vehicle to one of their locals, who reported the incident to law enforcement. Tackett drove there and interviewed this resident, who he observed had a very unique appearance that included cowboy boots with a matching hat. This local said he wouldn't be able to remember the car thief's appearance, but the shrewd investigator realized there was a good chance that the car thief would remember the man given his distinct look. Officer Tackett then asked the man to accompany him to several public spaces, hoping that perhaps the suspect would become nervous seeing him accompanied by a police officer and would try and flee. The gamble soon paid off. Walking into the Arkansas Motor Coach bus station a few days later, Tackett observed a man run out of the back of the building after he arrived and began giving chase. The officer ran into a rear alley and caught the man climbing up a fire escape. The man who'd fled was Yule Swinney, and suspiciously when Officer Tackett confronted him on the fire escape, Mr. Swinney begged him not to shoot. Tackett replied, quote, I'm not going to shoot you for stealing cars, to which Swinney responded, quote, Mr. Don't play games with me, you want me for more than stealing cars. He was arrested and taken to the police station, where he again alluded to his arrest being for something more severe than car theft, asking if he was going to, quote, get the chair, and that, quote, I know you have me here for more than cars. It had been just over a month and a half since the shooting of Virgil and Katie Starks, and Officer Tackett, as well as many of his colleagues, believed they had finally caught the elusive phantom killer. However, problems quickly began developing not long into their investigation of Swinney. For starters, Peggy's confessions became more and more contradictory the more they talked to her. Police believed this was due to her trying to minimize her involvement in the killings, but soon began losing trust in her story. A short time later, a letter Peggy had sent to her parents was intercepted, where she told them that she had lied to investigators during her confessions, and eventually she would go so far as to recant her statements entirely. Even worse, Mr. Swinney's fingerprints did not match the latent prints recovered from Paul Martin's vehicle, which meant the investigation hinged entirely on circumstantial evidence. And despite his early incriminating statements, 
you'll soon realize that police didn't have much evidence on him for the murders and quickly stopped talking. Knowing they would have little odds of success charging him in the murders, prosecutors elected to throw the book at him for his car thefts instead. Mr. Swinney was a three-time felon, meaning he could be given the harshest sentence for car theft allowed under Texas law, which was life in prison. Many officers later said they believed this was effectively an unofficial plea bargain, as they lacked evidence to charge him officially with the murders and Swinney desperately wanted to avoid the death penalty. He was convicted in 1947 and would spend the next 26 years in prison, but was eventually released when it was determined one of his prior charges which had been used to justify his extreme sentence was void due to the fact he had been denied legal representation. Yule would continue to deny his involvement in the phantom murders for the remainder of his life, until he passed away in a Dallas nursing home at the age of 77 in 1994. To this day, the Texarkana Moonlight murders have never been officially solved, and despite exhaustive investigations into the killings, little new evidence has been found. Many still believe Swinney was responsible for the murders, but with him and all of the investigators now dead, it is unlikely this case will ever be solved. Ironically, in the years since, the killings have become something of a local legend for the town of Texarkana, keeping the mysterious phantom story alive long after he himself had faded back into the shadows. This is Crime Spot, and thank you for watching.